In the tranquil atmosphere of my office, punctuated only by the soft hum of the air conditioner, I sat lost in a whirlwind of thoughts. My name is Anna, a 28-year-old lawyer whose current life stands in stark contrast to the chaotic turbulence of my early years. Those days, dark and tumultuous, are a chapter of my life I have kept securely locked away, hidden even from those closest to me. This bubble of serenity was abruptly burst by the shrill ring of my phone. The caller ID displayed an unknown number, yet something about it struck a deep, unsettling chord of familiarity. With a mix of professional poise and underlying apprehension, I answered, Anna speaking. The voice that came through was unmistakably my father's, tinged with nervousness. It had been over a decade since I last heard from him. His voice, which in my earliest memories had been a source of comfort and love, had transformed over the years into a symbol of deep-seated betrayal and pain. Why are you calling me? I asked sharply, my words slicing through the tense silence that followed his introduction. Anna, I'm in trouble, financially. I need your help, he replied, his voice cracking with a hint of desperation. His plea, however genuine it might have seemed, sparked a fierce wave of resentment in me. My help? Now you need me? After all these years? I said, my voice a volatile mixture of disbelief and anger. Yes, I... I wouldn't ask if it weren't serious. I'm really in a bind, he implored, desperation seeping into his tone. You stopped being my father a long time ago. You can't just call me now and expect me to help, I responded, my tone icy and resolute. There was a heavy, laden pause on the line, as if the distance between us had suddenly become palpable, an unbridgeable chasm of silence. Anna, please, I'm still your dad, he tried, his voice weak, an attempt to rekindle a bond that had long been extinguished. The word dad sounded alien, almost jarring to my ears. A dad? You forfeited that title when you chose her over me, I replied, the years of pent-up anger resonating in my voice. My life's calm exterior belied the chaotic turbulence of my childhood, a past I had firmly locked away, even from those closest to me. This semblance of peace was abruptly shattered by the ringing of my phone. The display showed an unknown number, yet it carried an ominously familiar aura. With a blend of professional poise and underlying caution, I answered, Anna speaking. The voice on the other end was unmistakably my father's, laced with a nervousness that did nothing to soothe my rising apprehension. It had been over a decade since I last heard that voice, once a symbol of safety and love, now a reminder of betrayal and pain. Why are you calling me? I demanded, my tone sharp, cutting through the silence that followed his introduction. Anna, I'm in trouble, financially. I need your help, he said, his voice cracking with what seemed like sincere desperation. His plea, however heartfelt it might have been, ignited a fierce blaze of resentment within me. My help? Now you need me? After all these years? I retorted, disbelief and anger intertwining in my voice. Yes, I... I wouldn't ask if it weren't serious. I'm really in a bind, he continued, desperation evident in his voice. You stopped being my father a long time ago. You can't just call me now and expect me to help. I replied, my voice cold and unwavering. There was a pause on the line, a heavy, tense silence that felt like an unbridgeable chasm. Anna, please. I'm still your dad, he said, his voice feeble, attempting to rekindle a bond long extinguished. Dad? You forfeited that title when you chose her over me, I said, the years of suppressed anger and hurt finding their way into my words. You're my daughter, he tried to reason. You thought wrong, I interrupted, cutting him off mid-sentence. You made your choice years ago, and now I've made mine. His voice was a mix of pleading and despair. Anna, I am sorry. I just need this one favor. The word sorry echoed in my office, a hollow, meaningless sound. Sorry doesn't change the past. I can't help you, I stated firmly and hung up. My childhood, before the age of ten, was filled with love and laughter, a testament to the wonderful life my parents and I shared in our small rented house. My mother, a beacon of joy and kindness, filled our days with warmth and our nights with stories and dreams. My father, 
once playful and caring, would spend evenings playing games with me or teaching me little things about the world. Our home was a cocoon of happiness, where every day was an adventure and every night a sweet dream. But our blissful life came to an abrupt halt with my mother's untimely death. The house that once echoed with laughter and love turned into a silent mausoleum of memories. I remember walking through the rooms, each corner a stark reminder of her absence. The loss was unbearable, not just for me, but for my father too, who had lost the love of his life. However, the depth of his grief seemed to diminish quickly, much to my confusion and dismay. Within just a few months, he brought home Marissa, a woman who would take a significant role in our lives. I recall the day he introduced her, a day that marked the end of my cherished childhood. Anna, this is Marissa. She's going to be staying with us, my father announced one evening, his voice devoid of the warmth I was so accustomed to. I looked up at her, searching for a hint of motherly warmth or friendliness, but found none. Her presence was imposing, her gaze cold and calculating. From that very first moment, I sensed a change in the air, a shift that filled me with an unexplainable sense of dread. Hello, Anna, Marissa said, her voice smooth but strikingly devoid of genuine warmth. Her smile, far from being comforting, seemed to conceal something more sinister beneath its surface. In the days that followed her arrival, the atmosphere of our house transformed. It felt as though the very walls were recoiling in her presence. The once cheerful memories that filled each room began to fade, replaced by a pervasive unease that settled into every nook and cranny. I often found myself observing Marissa, trying to discover some redeeming or kind quality in her, but each look, every gesture, seemed infused with an unspoken animosity. It became increasingly clear that she wasn't here to fill the void left by my mother, but rather to weave a new narrative, one in which I was an unwelcome part. Watching her move through our home, a place that had once been a haven of safety and happiness, I couldn't shake the feeling that her arrival marked the beginning of something ominous. The way she looked at me, with eyes that seemed to conceal more than they revealed, foretold a future that filled me with dread. The days after Marissa's arrival felt like navigating a nightmare from which I couldn't awaken. The house, once resonant with my mother's laughter and love, now felt cold and unwelcoming. Marissa's presence cast a long shadow over everything, turning even the simplest daily routines into a series of silent struggles. One morning, as I sat down for breakfast, I noticed an unusual saltiness in my food. Marissa, did you put too much salt in this? I asked my voice tinged with hesitance. Oh, did I? It must have been a mistake. Just eat it, Anna. Don't be so picky, she replied, her tone dismissive and almost mocking. Incidents like these became more frequent, each one subtly undermining the sense of home and security I once felt. With every dismissive comment and cold glance, the chasm between Marissa and me widened, leaving me to navigate my childhood's altered landscape alone. As the days passed, Marissa's behavior grew increasingly malicious and spiteful. One incident that stands out in my memory involved my clothes. After laundry day, I found my once favorite dress, now discolored and unwearable. Marissa, my clothes are all faded. What happened? I asked, holding up the ruined garment. She glanced at it with a nonchalant shrug. Maybe the washing machine is acting up or perhaps it's time you stop wearing such childish clothes. A surge of frustration welled up inside me, but I knew that arguing would be futile. Feeling helpless and without recourse, I turned to my father, hoping he would see through Marissa's facade. Dad, Marissa is ruining my things. She's always mean to me, I said one evening, my voice quivering with a mix of anger and sadness. However, my father's response was a crushing disappointment. Anna, you're imagining things. Marissa is doing her best to fit into our family. Stop causing trouble, he dismissed sternly, his words cutting deep into my heart. But Dad, it's the truth, I protested. But he was unyielding. That's enough, Anna. I don't want to hear any more of your accusations, he replied, his voice rising in anger. Each day became a struggle, trying to navigate around Marissa's hostility and my father's indifference. The home that once felt like a sanctuary now felt like a prison, I retreated more and more into my room, seeking to escape the constant tension that permeated the air. 
Living in that house felt like being trapped in a nightmare. I felt utterly alone and misunderstood. The safety and happiness that once filled those walls were now replaced by a pervasive atmosphere of fear and anxiety. I longed for the past, for the times when my mother's smile lit up the entire room, a stark contrast to the darkness that now loomed in every corner. Living with Marissa became a harrowing ordeal of evasion and endurance. Her hostility escalated from verbal jabs to physical abuse. It began subtly, a pinch on my arm, a twist on my stomach, always in places that were easily concealed under my clothes. The pain was sharp, a cruel reminder of my helplessness under her dominion. I developed strategies to avoid her, constantly alert to her whereabouts in the house. I would take circuitous routes to my room or wait until she was preoccupied before moving around. Despite my best efforts, there were times when she caught me off guard, and those moments inevitably resulted in some form of physical pain. One day, while I was quietly reading in the living room, Marissa walked in. During one of Marissa's unprovoked attacks, she pinched my arm fiercely, her nails digging painfully into my skin. I winced, suppressing any outcry as she looked at me with a cold, triumphant smirk before sauntering away. This incident was emblematic of the control and fear she exerted over me. It was during one of my grandmother's infrequent visits that my situation nearly came to light. Grandma noticed my cautious demeanor and the involuntary flinch that came over me whenever Marissa's voice echoed through the house. Anna, is everything all right at home? Grandma asked, her voice tinged with concern. I faced her, an inner turmoil raging as I yearned to divulge the truth. Yet, fear and a desire to spare her from worry held my tongue. Yes, Grandma, everything's fine. Just a lot of schoolwork, I lied, offering a forced smile. She seemed unconvinced, but chose not to probe further. A sense of guilt washed over me for deceiving her, but the thought of causing her distress was unbearable. That evening, as Grandma departed, I caught Marissa watching us from the window, her expression one of disturbing satisfaction. It was as though she reveled in the fact that she had control over me, that she could inflict pain and remain unchallenged. Her triumphant demeanor sent a clear message. She was the one in power, and I was merely a pawn in her twisted game. Retreating to my room, I felt entrapped in a cycle of abuse and enforced silence. The physical pain from Marissa's assaults was almost tolerable compared to the emotional agony they caused. School became my refuge, a place where I could momentarily escape the misery of home. However, the shadows of my domestic struggles began to cast a pall even there. Mrs. Thompson, my teacher, a compassionate woman who always sought to uplift her students, started noticing changes in me. One day, as I handed in my assignment, she gently grasped my wrist, her gaze fixating on the bruises marring my arm. Anna, what happened here? These look like bruises, she said, her voice laced with concern. I hastily retracted my arm, covering the bruises with my sleeve. It's nothing, Mrs. Thompson, I just... I fell while playing, I lied, avoiding her searching eyes. Mrs. Thompson's expression conveyed her skepticism. Anna, if there's something wrong, or if someone is hurting you, she began, her voice filled with worry and an unspoken offer of help. As I walked home that day, Mrs. Thompson's earnest words reverberated within me. I felt a complex blend of gratitude for her concern and an intense sense of isolation because of the secret I carried. The notion of exposing the truth about my life at home was daunting. The potential repercussions and Marissa's possible reaction if she discovered I had confided in someone filled me with dread. That evening at dinner, Marissa's keen observation of my uncharacteristic silence further unnerved me. Why so quiet tonight, Anna? Cat got your tongue? She taunted with a mocking undertone. I merely shook my head, continuing to eat, striving to be as inconspicuous as possible. Later, lying in bed, the enormity of my circumstances seemed more crushing than ever. Mrs. Thompson's compassion had highlighted that people cared, yet the overwhelming fear of the fallout from revealing the truth rendered me mute. I was trapped in a constant struggle, torn between the desperation to unburden myself and the terror of Marissa's potential retribution. The day Mrs. Thompson decided to involve my father marked a pinnacle of anxiety and apprehension. Sitting in the principal's office, I fidgeted nervously, 
my mind awash with fears of my father's reaction. When he arrived, his expression was stern, his eyes reflecting a mix of irritation and concern. He had been called away from his work, and his impatience was palpable. The principal, a kind but firm figure, started the meeting. Mr. Thompson, we're concerned about Anna. Her behavior at school has changed, and she's been showing up with bruises, the principal explained, his tone serious yet empathetic. My father's initial reaction was one of disbelief. Bruises? Anna, what is this about? he asked, turning to me with a bewildered expression. I felt my heart racing, the weight of the moment pressing down on me. The opportunity to speak up was there, yet the fear of Marissa's retribution held me back. I... I'm just clumsy, I muttered, a lie that felt hollow even as I spoke it. My father seemed to accept this too readily, relief washing over his features. He turned back to the principal. I assure you, everything is fine at home. Anna can be a bit careless, that's all. The principal appeared unconvinced, but didn't press further. The meeting ended with a reminder that the school was there to support me, but as we left the office, the reality of my situation remained unchanged. My father's readiness to dismiss the concerns without delving deeper left me feeling more isolated and helpless. The drive home was silent, each of us lost in our own thoughts, the unspoken truths hanging heavily in the air. In the principal's office, the tension was palpable. My father's irritation and embarrassment were evident as he demanded, What's this about, Anna? Why am I being called to your school like this? His sharp voice bore into me. I glanced at Mrs. Thompson, seeking a fraction of support before attempting to speak. Dad, I... Mrs. Thompson, she saw... She saw the bruises, I stammered, feeling the full weight of his intense gaze upon me. Before I could elaborate further, he cut me off, his anger tangible. Bruises? What are you talking about? Are you making up stories again? It was then that Mrs. Thompson interjected, her tone maintaining a balance of firmness and calm. Mr. Smith, I'm concerned about Anna's well-being. The bruises on her arm don't seem accidental. We need to address this. As my father's face darkened with anger, he retorted, She's perfectly safe at home. Anna, are you spreading lies about our family? His eyes, filled with disbelief and disappointment, turned towards me. The tears I had been desperately holding back began to spill over. It's not lies, Dad. Marissa, she's been hurting me, I finally confessed, the truth surfacing amidst a turbulent sea of emotions. His reaction was one of complete disbelief. Marissa? That's ridiculous. She's been nothing but kind to you. I won't have you slandering her with these accusations. But I persisted, my voice laced with desperation. But Dad, it's the truth, I cried out, yearning for him to understand, to believe me. He stood up abruptly, his patience clearly frayed. Enough of this. Tell Mrs. Thompson you made it all up. I reluctantly turned to my teacher and echoed his words my voice barely a whisper. Mrs. Thompson nodded silently, her expression unreadable. Upon returning home, my father ushered me to my room without a word and locked the door. Through the door, I could hear Marissa's voice oozing with feigned concern. I told you, she's just seeking attention, she said, her words like daggers. Alone in my room, a space that once felt like a sanctuary, I was engulfed by a profound sense of isolation and despair. The walls, which had once offered solace, now felt like the confines of a prison. Lying there, I was overwhelmed by the realization that the physical abuse, as painful as it was, paled in comparison to the emotional torment of being disbelieved and dismissed by my own father. The stark truth hit me with unrelenting force. The person who was supposed to be my protector and love me unconditionally was now the source of my deepest anguish. In the suffocating isolation of my room, the days stretched on, each one darker than the last. Feeling hopelessly trapped, I clung to the idea of reaching out to my grandmother. She was my father's mother, a beacon of kindness and affection in my life, yet I had always hesitated to involve her in my home troubles. One evening, seizing a moment when Marissa and my father were preoccupied, I summoned all my courage to make the call. With trembling hands, I dialed her number. Hello? 
Her warm, familiar voice resonated through the phone, a comforting contrast to the coldness of my room. Grandma, it's me, Anna, I managed to say, striving to keep my voice from quivering. Anna, my dear, how are you? Her voice was laced with genuine concern. Hearing her caring tone, tears sprang to my eyes. Grandma, I need help. Can I come and stay with you for a while? I blurted out, unable to hold back my desperation. There was a brief, heavy silence on the other end before she responded. What's wrong, Anna? Did something happen? Gathering my breath, I let the words tumble out in a rush. It's Marissa. She's been hurting me, and Dad won't believe me. I don't know what to do anymore. I could sense the alarm in her voice as she quickly replied, Of course, my dear. You come right over. I'll take care of this. The following day, my grandmother arrived. Despite her small stature, she carried an aura of determination and strength that seemed to fill the entire room. She faced my father with an unanticipated assertiveness. John, I'm taking Anna with me. She's not safe here, she stated with unwavering firmness. My father, visibly taken aback, attempted to protest. Mom, you can't just take her. She's my daughter. Your daughter whom you failed to protect, she shot back, her voice sharp with disapproval. I will not stand idly by while she suffers. Marissa attempted to interject, her voice laced with deceit. She's just a child making up stories. You can't believe her over us. My grandmother turned to face Marissa, her gaze piercing and resolute. I know what I believe, and I know what needs to be done. Anna is coming with me. Her tone left no room for argument, and in that moment, I felt a glimmer of hope amidst the darkness that had enveloped me. My grandmother's intervention was the lifeline I had been desperately searching for. Years had unfolded since I left the tumultuous environment of my father's house to live with my grandmother. Her home had become my sanctuary, a place where I found love, security, and the ability to heal. The difference between the warmth of her nurturing presence and the cold, oppressive atmosphere of my father's house was stark and profound. In her home, I rediscovered the freedom to breathe, to live without fear, and to gradually rebuild my shattered sense of self. However, as time marched on, it brought with it the inevitable tides of change. My beloved grandmother, the rock of my existence, passed away. Her death left a gaping void in my life, a loss that felt insurmountable. At her funeral, my father and Marissa made an appearance, their faces a blend of superficial sorrow and poorly concealed anticipation. It was painfully obvious that their interest lay more in what they might gain from her passing than in mourning her. After the funeral, as we gathered at my grandmother's house, Marissa lost no time in revealing her true intentions. Well, Anna, I suppose you'll be finding a new place to live now, this house and everything in it belongs to your father now, she said, her voice dripping with barely veiled glee. My father, standing beside her, nodded in agreement, his eyes greedily scanning the room, already envisioning his plans for the property. To their surprise, I couldn't help but smile. My reaction seemed to perplex them both. Actually, you're both mistaken, I said, my voice steady and imbued with a newfound confidence that seemed to take them aback. What do you mean? my father asked, his expression morphing into one of confusion and irritation. Taking a deep breath, I relished the moment of unveiling the truth. Grandma left a will. She bequeathed the house and a substantial amount of her assets to me, I explained, watching their expressions shift from confusion to disbelief and shock. But, but you're just a child. I'm your father. I should be in charge of any inheritance you receive, my father stammered, his sense of entitlement palpable. Marissa quickly joined in, her voice sharp and shrill. Yes, until you come of age, it should be under your father's control. Their reactions were as predictable as they were misguided. My grandmother, wise and loving even in her final decisions, had foreseen such a scenario. Her will had been meticulously crafted, ensuring that I would be protected and that her legacy would support my future, free from the manipulative reach of my father and Marissa. Standing there, in the home that was now rightfully mine, I felt a deep sense of gratitude and respect for my grandmother. She had given me not just a home, but a future filled with hope and possibility. Their reactions, almost amusing in their predictability, unfolded before me. 
My father and Marissa, who had never shown genuine concern for my well-being, were now grasping at straws. Your father will manage your property. It's for the best, Marissa said, her voice laced with false concern. I couldn't help but chuckle at their audacity. You don't care about me. You've made that abundantly clear. You didn't even wish me a happy birthday, I retorted. Their faces registered confusion, not understanding the significance of my statement. I turned 18 a month ago. I'm legally an adult now. I make my own decisions, I declared, my words drenched in the newfound authority of adulthood. The realization dawned on their faces, shifting from shock to anger, and then, in my father's case, to a sort of desperate pleading. Anna, you can't do this. We're your family, he implored. His voice tinged with disbelief. The memories of my childhood, the pain, and the neglect flooded back. You stopped being my family a long time ago, I said, my voice unwavering, echoing the finality of my decision. Marissa, now shifting to a tone of begging, tried a different tactic. At least let us stay in the house. We have nowhere else to go. We haven't extended the lease on our house. I shook my head firmly, unswayed by their pleas. This is my house now. You'll need to find somewhere else, I stated, the words marking a new chapter in my life. As they left, the burdens of years of pain and neglect seemed to fall away from my shoulders. I stood alone in the house that was now rightfully mine, surrounded by the memories of my grandmother's love. It was a sanctuary, a testament to her care and foresight, offering me closure and a sense of peace. Later, as I sat alone, my father's callous actions replayed in my mind. Holding the phone in my hand, a whirlwind of emotions engulfed me, anger, betrayal, and a deep sense of injustice. But among these turbulent feelings, there was also an underlying current of strength, a reminder of the resilience that had seen me through the darkest of times. My grandmother's legacy had not just been a physical haven, it had been a source of inner strength, teaching me to stand firm against adversity and to carve out a path of dignity and self-respect.